Our final presenter is Ralph, Ralph Arza. Mr. Arza is the Director of Government Relations for the Florida Charter School Alliance. Mr. Arza coached football and taught social studies at Miami Senior High School for 18 years before being elected to the Florida House of Representatives where he served from 2000 to 2006. While in the House, he served as the chair of the Education K-12 Committee and championed many education and student issues. Welcome back to the House, Representative Arza. You are recognized to present. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I have a set of alternative facts today that I want to share with, with the committee. <laughs> <laughs> and and, um, and uh, number one, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your service, the sacrifice you make from your families and your work to do what you do. And being in this room reminds me how a lot of the meetings that uh, we had. So thank you for what you do. Um, I wanted to be, you know, a little bit brief and really have a uh, a, a real conversation with you to try to give you as members an opportunity to know what is the real landscape in Florida and are things lovely dovely like that movie was it La La Land or is it or you know or, or are things what, what is the healthy tension and what are some of the challenges that are being faced now the Florida Charter School Alliance we represent uh, academic schools charter schools USA we represent small charters like uh, two schools in Pahokee Florida we're, uh, that are run by a nonprofit organization uh, that is put together by Amelia Van Hool. So we have a wide range of large networks, and we also have small schools that we represent. On our board of directors, um, you have uh, a group of people somewhere in this room. Um, Jim Horn, chairman of the uh, of our of our board, is here. He is the one that championed the charter school law back in 1996. Uh, we have Lynn Norman Tech. She's our executive director, and here's Lynn with the beautiful red dress. Um, and um, she not only is, she's been part of the charter movement, but she's a charter school mom and uh, takes that choice very seriously. And you see the rest of the folks that are in our organization and very proud to have Mr. Cartley, Patricia Levesque, et cetera, and, and active members, John Hage from Charter Schools USA, Ignacio Sulueta. We can go on to the next one. And then we'll move on because some of these, some of these facts or some of the things that uh, that we would present to you were presented by my colleague uh, that was being very brief, so I want to be very brief too. Um, what are some of the, the issues that confront, you know, when, when you read in the, in the media, you know, for-profit charters, the word for-profit charter does not exist. And when you hear that reported by the media, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not, not true. You know, all profit schools in Florida are not for profit. They're all 501c3s. They have an independent board. That board, in some cases, elects to hire a for-profit management company. And some of those management companies have a track record of incredible success. And that's the only for-profit entity, not dissimilar to public school districts like Polk County. Polk County, at one point, hired Accelerated Learning Academies, uh, a for-profit, alternative, contracted school to provide services for their school district. No different than what a charter school does, the nonprofit board, when they hired a for-profit for entity. Um, we have taken uh, surveys in the state of Florida where we've done active polling this la last election cycle, and I shared some of this with, with Chairman Beleka um, and also Chairman Lavalla. And as mentioned by my colleagues, parents want choice, and they, want, they don't want to qualify that choice. And, you know, and I respect the, the lottery system that was described. It seemed kind of complicated. You know, our system of lottery, sometimes we have a waiting list and there's a lottery that has to be instituted by law. But parents can choose whatever school they believe in their heart is the best school for their child. Eighty-two percent of parents in the state of Florida believe that they are the best qualified to determine what school they send their child. And what we've tried to do at the, at the Alliance and what I tried to do when I was a member here is protect that choice. And the choice that sadly sometimes, I grew up in the city of Miami right across from the Orange Bowl, the old Orange Bowl. And what was choice back then? Parents would, would uh, lie where they live in order to qualify for a better school. And that's when you had truant, you know, these uh, school uh, truant uh, officers that would go and verify where you live because people were trying to jockey or trying to almost break the law to try to get their son or their daughter in a better performing school. What's happening today, 
thank God that this legislature and its wisdom has and the governors that we've had have all supported school choice. You know, look, I, I'm obviously a, a Republican and, you know, I, I love to see that Barack Obama supported school choice and uh, Joe Biden supported school choice and they had Arne Duncan supported school choice. So school choice is something that I believe this is not an experiment anymore. This is here to stay. And the more that you can do as a committee to encourage that, to have more of that, I think the better off that parents are going to be in this state. And there is healthy tension between school districts and the charter movement. Sometimes the sparks will go off and you'll read about it. You know, like last week, you know, the, the court, uh, district court of appeal ruled, the fourth district ruled that Palm Beach County did not have the right almost it was a meritless act for them to deny a charter schools USA application that had been and and there was a process there's a process in place if you apply to the district and the school district in its infinite wisdom they are constitutional officers they vote to deny the application on some sort of merit some sort of reason it goes to the state that the state then has a committee that reviews it then the State Board of Education votes. They're constitutional officers, too. What happened in this case, it was overturned. It went down to the school district, and I was there, and you had school board members that says, you know, this is an act of civil disobedience, and we don't think this is innovative. We don't think that um, this is uh, something different than what we do, so we're going to deny, and we're not going to accept a recommendation from the state. Now, how much dollars were spent, taxpayer dollars, defending this? And at the end, it was ruled, the court ruled it was meritless. Um, so when you see these kind of situations, and sometimes you'll see the charter movement come to you and want you to pass regulations, it's this tension that exists between the charter movement and the existing public, public schools in our state. Some superintendents do an incredible job and are smart to, to get in front of the tsunami. Alberto Carvalho in Miami-Dade County. Almost 70% of every child in Miami data is in a choice program because he realizes he has to compete. You know, in Polk County, you've had incredible competition. When I was a member, you had, to me, it was the greatest declaration of independence of a community, Lake Wales Charter. Those, that community got together, and they took over uh, some of their schools. They converted the schools. They converted them by a vote of the parents and a vote of the teachers. And I commend those teachers. Even though some were union members, they thought more about the children, like Ruth mentioned, than they did about protecting the status quo. They took over their district. And what did that do? That, I think, motivated uh, Polk County to have more competition and more choice. So the more choice that you've seen, now, should it be somewhat regulated? Absolutely, there should be some regulation. And that's, uh, you, you know, your job and uh, uh, in your infinite wisdom to decide what is fair, how do, we, how do we make it fair for everybody in this competitive environment? And that competitive environment, ultimately, the winners of that are, are, are the kids and our moms and dads who now have a choice that, you know what, they didn't have before. So I hope this gives you, you know, a little bit of, of what's, what's uh, happening in, our, in the districts. And um, one of the things that we would ask you to do is, uh, you know, why don't we have charter schools in the most at risk, more schools in the most at risk areas? Well, you know what, if it is challenging that if you get two Fs, you are shut down. Right. And I would encourage this committee to consider extending that to a probationary period. If you are serving an at risk population, it probably takes and there's more people that are better trained than I am that are academics that will tell you it takes three years, probably three years to turn a school around. So, you know what, there should be a probationary year where that school is given a chance, as long as they're making academic progress, as long as they're not, they're doing the right thing with, with taxpayer funds, that you give them that opportunity. I think that would be uh, something good. Um, now, there's been a lot of conversation about bringing in um, different charter networks into the state of Florida. And, and you know, you hear about Green Dot or Red Dot, or there's, there's these different organizations. And the Florida Charter School Alliance is supportive of that. The only thing we would like you as members um, to know, um, that we have some of the top performing charter networks right here in the state of Florida. The two biggest charter organizations, probably in the United States, management companies, come from South Florida. And, and I hope you take that into consideration. We have some other charters, like uh, uh, 
I'm uh, the lady from Polk County mentioned regarding um, some charters focused on serving an alternative population. And they take kids. And look, I was part of, you know, I passed third grade retention law. I passed middle school reform. And sometimes when we pass and we raise the bar, there are casualties. Those casualties are kids. But well, we got to make sure, I think, uh, uh, and you as members, that what is the what are you going to do about the kids that don't make it? What are you doing? What are you providing? Because if you fall out of cohort, by uh, if you're retained twice in, in in elementary school, you go to middle school, you're li- you're reading at level one in the FCAT. It's going to be tough. So what happens? What happens to that child? And <clears throat> when that child gets to high school, so you can fall behind, and you almost become an unwanted person because you're going to hurt the graduation rate of that, whatever school you go to. And a lot of these charters that come in and take those children, um, a lot of them are managed by, by an organization called ALS. They do an incredible job of taking these unwanted kids that are past and getting them across the finish line. Now, when you look at their graduation rate, it looks like they have 11% or 10% graduation rate. It's not really indicative because they were behind before they started. And I understand the reasons, why, you know, for some of those things. So, um, look, um, once again, thank you for the work that you do. Um, this choice thing is a real thing. It's the only issue that I come up here to Tallahassee and continue, uh, you know, to fight this battle now on the outside. And uh, I'm available. Um, Lynn is available. Um, our members were very committed to being very aggressive, and we will fight the fights. We we were part of the lawsuit um, that that tried to defend what happened in Palm Beach County, and there were some board members there that I believe, you know, and they still want to take it to the Supreme Court, you know, and and I believe like their personal view, and there are school board members that get elected, and they have a personal view against charters, and and what I believe is that when you got elected as a school board member, you're there to defend all the children in your district, not just the ones that go through the traditional public schools. Charter schools are public schools, and you need to defend those children also. And that's where the tension comes, and that's where the sparks t- sometimes fly. Thank you, members. Thank you very much, Representative Arza. Um, members, any questions or comments? Uh, Representative Fisher. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Representative Ars, as a former school board member, I, I say amen uh, to your comments there okay. towards the end. Um, I had two, two questions for you, um, and hopefully you'll be able to, to keep it somewhat brief. Uh, talking about funding compared uh, traditional public schools or district schools um, and funding with charter schools, what's the discrepancy there? Could you kind of break down those numbers and then maybe give us what you think is the um, biggest barrier you know, a couple barriers to continued success uh, for your members. Thank you. You're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, and those are two great questions. Number one, when it comes to capital outlay, capital outlay is the money that's used for facilities. It, right now in the state of Florida, it's about between 350, 400 bucks or 500 bucks per student f- for the facility. And that is critical. Now, the more parents who send their children to charter schools, the more demand there is on that capital outlay fund. The need, the real need, is probably somewhere around maybe $180 million is needed to fund the capital outlay, the growth. More parents are sending their children, and the funds have stayed a little bit behind. The House was very aggressive in supporting us for the past several years. We appreciate that tremendously. So in capital, we don't get part of the two mil, the local two mil. When there's a tax referendum, like there was one in Palm Beach County, one um, – in Miami-Dade County, charter schools don't get any of that, right? So facilities become a big issue. If you don't have the facilities money, then you have to dip into your operational to be able to pay for the facility, and then that you're taking money directly from teachers, teacher salaries, and student services. Um, so I think that the on the regular FTE, we get the regular FTE. Like Ruth mentioned, we get 95% of the FTE, sometimes 97% if you're high-performing. Um, and... Uh, we've done a great job of what this legislature has ad- uh, advocated, and we've done very well. Um, I think those are the two main issues. I think that, that capital funding becomes the single number one issue for, and, the, and tr- uh, capital funding should not be contingent upon academic performance. And that's a touchy subject, but if, you, if, if a school received an F and you take their, their capital funding, you're, you're hurting that. You're hurting that school. 
at, and you're hurting kids at the end of the day. That so capital funding should not be contingent upon academic performance. Representative Asensio, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great presentation, all. My question is about uh, an assessment. If you can give just a broad-based assessment of the shortage in the charter schools with regard to teaching, is it, is it the same as the public sector? And then I have a follow-up question with regard to exceptionalities, accepting students with exceptionalities. You're um, recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, and, um, at the end of the day, we all get our teachers pretty much from the same place. Charters are allowed to hire people out of, you know, like you can hire someone. I mean, you can be out of field. The, it has to be approved, et cetera. Um, we also are allowed as charters to hire principals that are not, you know, uh, part of the traditional educational environment. And that has worked sometimes, and it's been well, but there has to be some training provided to people. But there is a shortage of teachers. You know, and being a former teacher and former coach, um, it's a profession that you don't get paid a lot. You know, the rewards are incredibly, uh, you know, are very special. We need to do more to be able to recruit more people into the teaching profession, and we have to rethink how we educate teachers. We need to think out of the box in that. We all get our teachers from the same place, the traditional, the traditional um, state system that we have. Follow up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with regard to exceptionality, students uh, being enrolled into charter schools with exceptionality, is that the movement of the charter school industry to move in that direction? You recognize? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I wouldn't say, I mean, as part of the charter school movement, charter schools are required to accept every child that comes. If there's a child with a profound exceptionality, when you get into the 254s and 255s, profound exceptionalities, they can't. But right now, if you're a 251, 252, even a 253, you're given an opportunity. There is a process by which that takes place, and the question ultimately is, can, our, can that school service that child? If they can't, because of the limited resources. Remember, when it comes to federal funds, when it comes to different things, the public school system has a lot more dollars than we do. We have a, we have a fight in Palm Beach County over IDEA funds that come from the federal government, where they decided how much they were going to give us. They felt they were overpaying us. Then we had to come back and push. Superintendent De Arvosa was very cooperative and tried to come back with a better offer. It's now in mitigation with the department. So there, there is fight because we don't have the equal resources. So if we do have the resources and we can meet the needs of that child, we do. And we're doing it right now. <clears throat> Representative Hager, you recognize? Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Representative, uh, past Representative Arza. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you for all those years of service. Um, I just, uh, just have a very basic question for you. We have 250 years of global monetary history that shows that free markets, competition, choice, 250 years, competition produces, delivers the best product at the best price. And Florida's experience as to schools shows that schools are no exception to that rule that, again, runs 250 years. As a former math teacher, as a former school board member myself, I continue to be dumbfounded at this late date in Florida's maturation as to the resistance to charter schools. So my question to you is pretty simple. What Explain the resistance. How did? How is it rationalized? Right. You recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I think the biggest thing is, uh, sir, the following. And and I think, and I'm not going to question somebody's motives and somebody's intentions. I'm not going to question the school board's motives and intentions. People get elected to the school board, and they believe that their job is to protect the system <coughs> instead of protecting children. So the resistance comes where. They're so focused on, you know, keeping jobs. Look, the school system is not an employment agency. If you have, if you have a need for employees, you, you, you hire them. And the day you don't have a need for employees, you let them go. And I will say this to you, and this is confidential. I don't want to say the person's name. Um, I'm showing restraint. Um, 20, there's one district in Florida that has 20,000 teachers. How many teachers are fired last year? One. In a charter school, if you have a teacher who's not doing their work, they're let go on Friday. And they say, thank you very much for your service. But you're, you're, because you cannot go back and fix the child that you 
if you're an incompetent teacher that you could be hurting. Now, what is, what, so what did we do uh, in the process? Allow that parent to take the child out of that class and say, you know what, you're no longer going to teach my child, and I'm going to take my child and put him somewhere else, exercising my, my choice. And that's why the more you do for choice, the better off we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Lee, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Latvala. Um, former Representative Aza, I had a conversation recently, just yesterday, I think it was with the chair, and we were talking about choice, and I think it's great. Um, one of the things, that's why I asked the question about um, Lee County. I, I'm going to come over and visit because, uh, you know, my concern, um, not as just a legislator, but a taxpayer, I, I think all of our sh schools should be doing what the charter schools are doing. And I would like to see us, and it appears that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, in Lee County, it's almost like you you set up a sort of a similar environment that the, within the public school system that the charter school systems are, uh, uh, the charter schools are doing. And I saw this documentary a few years ago where up in Washington, D.C., they had this extremely successful charter school and uh, thousands of students would apply for that school and they showed the families of these students who were getting ready that day to go to this big gymnasium where where they were going to wait to see their names be called out and as they called out the few hundred numbers that were chosen you saw the expression on the families of those kids and the families that were not able to be chosen and they had to go back to these schools that uh, were public schools that were in really bad areas and that were uh, windows were broken and this is, is very bad and and that's that's the concern that I have as we create more and more charter schools why don't we try and find ways to do in my opinion what Lee County is doing uh, I, I think that it, it is sad for me to see um, in particular as a legislator um, we're going to say, okay, kids, parents, we can't save all of you, but we're going to come in here and out of 100, we're going to save 10 of you. The rest of you, fend for yourself until next year. Come in. You recognize? Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, you know, if you're going are you going to file a bill? I'm sure you have co-sponsors. If you're going to file <laughs> a bill <laughs> regarding that, um, I would just tell you that. Um, the more that you can do to ultimately empower those parents. And, some, and there are districts who do an incredible job. You have school teachers who do an incredible job in those public schools. And they're incredibly talented. There just aren't enough of them. And sometimes in practice, it's not what is sometimes presented in theory. And that, you know, why do you have parents wanting this choice is because they're not happy with what they're currently getting. And then they're not. And if you, and if you were to, you know, I asked a, a, a school district, do you do an exit survey of every parent who chooses to send their, to take their child to a charter school? Why don't you survey them? And why don't you ask them, why did they leave? And many times they don't, no one's done it, and I've challenged people to do it. Why are parents leaving you? If my customers are leaving me, I would ask myself, okay, what, what's the reason? What am I not doing? What am I not providing? The, the districts that, like, you know, Lee County with their choice program and other districts have an incredible choice program like Miami-Dade. Broward has been very embracing of charters. They have the li our largest percentage of charter schools, probably in the state of Florida, their population, per population. So... You have people that do, and then you have people that are being somewhat um, protective in, in, in their approach. And I don't know if that answers your question, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and and, and the, uh, Mr. Moore, maybe you can, I, I, I saw you nodding your head. I think you know where I'm going here. If you turn to uh, the page in your, in your um, book, uh, Student Assignment, and there's a comparison, district school versus charter enrollment. And as you go across there, um, and it looks like it's some pretty great success uh, starting in 2012 to th 2017. Um, can you elaborate on, on um, the what I appear to be the success of that chart? You recognize? Yeah, certainly, Representative Lee. Uh, what the chart really represents is uh, enrollment growth throughout the district, including charters. 
uh, in our district schools being around 4% and just highlighting the fact that the school district of Lee County is attracting a larger number of those families moving into the district as an option to go to our school. And I'll, and I'll tell Dar, uh, Mr. Arza that we look at di uh, charter schools as part of the school choice program. They don't participate in the lottery. We don't assign students to them, but it's a viable option for any of our parents. We are one option. They're the other option. But I will share with you that we do have quite a few charter schools that have closed as well. So that affects this number as well. Um, there may be many that are at capacity. We do have a city charter school in Cape Coral that's very uh, successful uh, and a very good partner with the school district. And we have others that come in and target a particular population that are certainly not as uh, successful as others. Um, so the chart I was just trying to highlight the fact that the district offers an option to even those families that might not be um, impressed with other district schools, but uh, our choice program is doing something correct if, this, if this, these are the numbers that we're seeing. So just highlighting the fact that we look at enrollments also in private schools in comparison with our district schools as an indicator of how are people perceiving us and what do we need to do to be competitive with them, but at the same time maintain a partnership. Final comment. Yes, sir. And I, I just want to be on record as saying that I'm not against charter schools. I support it. I just want all our schools to, to be like charter schools. If we're going to do it, I, I, I'm just concerned about some of these kids that, uh, in my opinion, being left behind because they don't have the same opportunities uh, to get into some of these schools. But I think that what you're doing, and I, I plan to come up and make a visit over to your school because I, I, maybe I should uh, use Lee County as a model and say from this day forth, I'm a sponsor of Bill, all schools be like Lee County. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Sir. Chairman Labell. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can I just make one comment? Um, you know, we did a focus group. Um, and in that focus group, we asked a, a group of voters uh, about moving kids that were trapped in failing schools. And a, a lady in the room, she was a Democrat from Broward County, and she said, and it was very profound, and I'll never forget that moment. She said, what happens to the kids that are left behind? What happens to the kids who don't go to the charter school or don't go somewhere else? What happens to them? And what I learned at that moment, one of the fundamental principles of America is that education and, and a public education is one of the pillars of democracy. And Americans deep down inside don't want to ever give up on a public school. And, and I don't think anybody is advocating to give up on any public school. However, there has to be an ability to take children out of a failing environment. And that's what I think the, the work that lies ahead for this committee would be looking at balancing that whole thing up. Thank you. Uh, Ranking Member Brizzo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Representative Arza, you, you are right about Secretary Duncan because he came from the Chicago public school system and, and they opened the door more into choice uh, for, for their fa failures in, in Chicago. Uh, but to answer a little bit of Representative Hager's question and, and some of the comments of Palm Beach County, I believe the discontent specifically with Palm Beach County comes to the original intent of charter schools. Uh, you know, originally it was set up to supplement public schools for special needs, and they have slowly morphed into uh, really, uh, I don't want to say competition, but uh, a mere match for traditional school, which has caused some of the longstanding educators uh, to grow concern that, that, that have been there from the beginning. But I think that, you know, I, I often tell those uh, in Palm Beach County that, that uh, are against charter schools that they're here to stay. Uh, regardless if we like them or not, uh, it's the law, and, and I do not see it moving away anytime soon. So how do we make that system better? Uh, you heard my question, and we just heard from Lee County that uh, multiple uh, schools have failed, and I think if we can make the system better, put up a strong bond so some of the schools that you showcase, some of the pillars of the charter school movement that have undeniable records of achievements, uh, they're the ones that are here everlasting, where the fly-by-nights, if you will, uh, are financially uh, on the hook, and they just can't, can't open. And I think more that we come to parity, um, where since, as the talking point is, charter schools are public schools, if, as long as we start to match them more and more throughout the years as it evolves, uh, and, and I'll give one good example, and I, and I, and I gear towards the failing schools. 
or, or the students leaving. Right now, the money doesn't follow the student. When a student leaves a charter school because of a failure, because they decide to leave, our state funds stay with the charter school, doesn't go back into the public school system or, or the traditional public school system. So I think as, as, we, as we get, uh, again, as we move along and, and try to find that gap, uh, I, my, I actually do have a question. Uh, the two-year fail, and I understand growing pains in, in areas I'm uh, fortunate enough to represent Pahokee, so I, I know the work that, you, that you're doing out that way. Uh, what, is the, what does it look like right now for, our, and I should know this and I apologize, our, our traditional public schools, if they get enough, when, when does the clock start to run on them versus the charter schools? And, and I would just tell you, uh, Representative Senator, um, is that a, the traditional public schools, if they get to us, they do not shut down. They're given an ample time to try to turn that around. I think Chairman Baleka is looking at, at looking at uh, the turnaround schools and try to cut cut off the time that you can do that. So I have not, and maybe I'm, you know, I might have missed one. I, I haven't heard of a public school shutting down. And you know what? We in the alliance support the closing of charter schools that are not performing for financial reasons or for academic reasons. Mm -hmm. They should close if they're not performing. Just follow. Yes, sir. Th thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, and again, you will hear me throughout the year and, and hopefully next year if the chair still has me, um, you know, talk about a little bit closer to the parity. Um, you know, you look at things uh, like, the, like the building code. Our charter schools uh, just have to build the schools up to the Florida Buildings Code, not what our public schools have to build to. So to keep our kids, we set the law here in Florida to make sure that our buildings that our students in are the best and the safest can be in our traditional public schools, but yet a charter school uh, can open up in a, sh in a strip mall. So, you know, I, I think as since you are public school, as long as we start slowly but surely closing that gap so a parent cannot tell the difference when it comes to the infrastructure, when it comes to testing, when it comes to how our teachers are treated, I think you'll see uh, even greater bipartisan effort. That's Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Killebrew, you're recognized. No, thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chair. What, what, Mr. Arthur, what is your feeling about uh, out-of-state management groups for charter schools that come in and we're using taxpayers' money, Florida taxpayers' money, that they eventually take some out-of-state? I mean, how do you feel about out-of-state management groups? Oh, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. I know not to violate that rule. Um, no, but it, it's a great question. I, I just think that if somebody, if there's an organization who's doing an incredible job in serving children that can come to our state and can impact our children, we should give them that opportunity. At the end of the day, a charter school only exists because parents choose to send their children there. If, if all the parents decided one day to take all the kids out of a charter school, that school closes. So it's really demand-driven. So if, if I'm open to it as long as it's fair competition and we don't neglect those that have been here from the beginning who have the battle scars and have paid a price to stay in our state. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'll try to make this a question. <laughs> but uh, I think I want to like to pose it to uh, represent ours, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, as a preface, I'd like to say, I think even those of us who are pro-choice, strongly pro-choice, are not anti-traditional public school. Right. There is, it, it, it's simply a fact. I don't care whether it is a public school system or it's a business in, uh, in you know, who's given a monopoly, right? Anytime you have an institution given uh, complete control over any area, whether it's education or whether it's making a specific kind of a widget, they become less flexible, less responsive, less attentive, less attuned to the needs of their customers, so to speak. <coughs> I would submit to you, and maybe you would agree, and this is my question, if the traditional charter schools were given the exclusive monopoly to control education, they would, they too would become less responsive, ultimately less attentive, ultimately less concerned about the needs of the parents and the students. So this really is about, this what underlies everything that we've done with respect to choice. 
it's not a, a, a you know a statement or an indictment against the public school system they're not the villain it's an understanding of the fact that when you give exclusive control to anything they are not attentive to, to, to the needs of the customers yes sir you recognize yeah and, and representative um, thank you for your question and when we were researching this there was one US president and who said no monopoly in the history of mankind has ever um, changed itself They've never, you know, changed because they didn't have to change. That president was Bill Clinton in our research. So it's like any monopoly left to itself would be bad. And I would be against, on the other side, that if charters were the only game in town, after a period of time they would revert back and get lazy and not have to compete. The competition, back to Representative Hager's comments about free market. The greatest thing about this country, and I'm an immigrant to this country, is the fact that you have choices. And you've got them everywhere. But, and it's good that we have them in the, in the public school uh, area. And we need to f keep that going and encourage more of that. 